Good morning, everyone, and welcome back to Project CDE Chronicles, or welcome. If it's your first time, we continue our short video regarding the undocumented codes of the 6502 and 6510, and in particular. In this short video, we will look at an article written by Michael Stein in 2008, which illustrates in a detailed and structured way the construction of these opcodes. And um, at the end of the video, we will also look at some opcodes in more detail. So if you're interested, I invite you to watch the video until the end, as I mentioned. Essentially, this article from 2008, as I was saying, explains how do the operational codes work? Those that were once called illegal, but are now referred to as undocumented, of the MOS 6502 processor, which was used not only for the Commodore 64, but also for the Apple Nintendo and the NES, Nintendo Entertainment Systems. And now we will look at some key points, especially here it is indicated as 151, and we will discuss them briefly. Essentially, as mentioned here, the 6502 has the capability of having 256 possible operational codes precisely in an 8-bit value. And among other things, we have already seen how this, this is obtained and divided. Regarding this, they tell us some bits are for addressing, other bits are for the opcode itself, and other bits are for additional information. However, oh, we have the remaining, let's say, 105 codes. They are not defined because if we count those actually defined in the 6502 and 6510 processes, they are exactly as stated here, says the article, and count 151. So these remaining opcodes that, in fact, are not used because they would break compatibility with future revisions. They do exist. They do something. And often they are a combination of what are defined as multiple opcodes. Legal, the, um, those that today we know to be the ones actually documented. So uh, in this article, I would refer to both the illegal opcodes, hence illegal opcodes, but also to the undocumented opcodes, which are essentially the same thing. The article then continues regarding the block diagram of the 6502 processor, as you can see, decoding regarding the information. So uh, unlike other processors, let's say, from that era, which used what was a microcode, uh, the 6502 used what is here, you see, defined as the PLA, a programmable logical array, that is a decoding ROM that interprets what the instructions are. And this PLA, in fact, acts succinctly by comparing the operational code and the current cycle of COD to determine which signals to activate. But here it is explained in more detail. Again, this PLA, the article, tells us, is organized in lines, each of which checks certain conditions on the bits of the operational code. And regarding the COC cycles, however, I invite you to read it here because it is uh, a more detailed explanation. If a line, so to speak, matches, then a control signal is generated. But this is a more engineering focused discussion that is beyond our scope. However, oh, how do illegal codes work? And here we have a more extensive discussion. They do not have lines, specific and actual ones regarding the PLA. So, as I mentioned earlier, but they often correspond to combinations of similar legal or documented codes. For example, if we take AF, as we saw in the previous video, this corresponds to what is LAX absolute and combines the functionalities of AD and combines the functionalities of AE. So, LDA absolute and AD, LDX absolute call. So, in fact, with this single opcode, you can merge what is the loading of a value. Regarding two registers, since indeed AF corresponds to the PLA lines of both opcodes. And so here, however, there is a more technical and detailed explanation. So AD and AE, as the article then refers to. And it does exactly that at this point here. Oh, so that technically it is possible to have an additional activation e opcode with a different code. So on our, how oh, can we see? The same single opcode influences, so AF, influences two other opcodes, which are AD and AE. And so the 8-bit value is loaded into both registers A and X. Clearly, this is a more simplified example. There are also more complex opcodes that interact with other, let's say, basic opcodes, where they clearly generate a methodology or more complex opcodes, for example, SACs which we will look at the end of the video. We continue scrolling through the article, and here we see some kill op codes, some of these, so to speak, illegal codes. We continue like this. To call them, uh, they are called 
kill. Oh, that is why is this? Because in fact, they block the processor, requiring what is a complete reset to start it even hardware wise. This happens essentially because there is no clock cycle. And so we have to start over again. The PLA corresponds to the PLA line that restores, but, uh, so to speak, the correct clock cycle likely goes into error and gets frozen when a fetch practically occurs. As a result, the processor enters a state where it cannot execute further instructions. And it also ignores your all series of interrupts. That's why it's one of those reasons why these uh, op codes should be used sparingly. Now, let's move to our trusty turbo assembler and essentially begin to examine the behavior of some of these opcodes in more detail. Now, uh, the turbo assembler, for example, as you can see here, uh, directly recognizes what uh, the opcodes are regarding the uh, illegal ones. Here I had already made a your compilation. So here too, you see LAX recognizes them. I am not aware if all these opcodes are recognized by the various types of assemblers that exist, Essentially, we can still, in this case, behave differently in this way, as I have done here. For example, if we look at the table regarding the opcodes that we will see right away, we can put what is a byte. For instance, here it loads a byte in page zero as the one that is present here. It would be exactly this. If it is not present, we can load what is a byte point, which we directly give the code. And then with this macro, we can uh, overcome if it is not present in your compilers to uh, assemble this type of solution. It is exactly the same thing. Let's take a closer look at this type of opcode. And in this video, we will also see others. So essentially, LAX has six possibilities with the basic addressing modes concerning page zero. At page zero indexed, I obviously have to, since LAX obviously doesn't have the zero page dex, for obvious reasons, however, it has indexed addressing indirect, indirect indexed, and can essentially uh, uh, always access those that are absolute addresses. So from page zero to a 16-bit address, and moreover, it also has the ability to add the Y register. And uh, essentially, LAX behaves exactly like loading the value, so to speak, both in the A register and in the X register. Obviously, one must also refer to the various status registers because just as it is normally loaded into the accumulator, the other two registers are also set, uh, as you can see here from the table. And this must be kept in mind, not only in programming, in assembler normally, but particularly in these types of opcode. Now let's see this opcode in action. So as I was telling you, I have, in, let's say, in including what is a small library of illegal opcodes that we can refer to, for example, to what is more essentially the loading of a byte into a register, page deal. And since instead of introducing it manually, we introduce it through what are macros. So essentially we have the byte as, which is then interpreted as what in this case is lax, but like everyone. And then we put our value into what is a, in fact the second byte. So here we have minus one and we do nothing else but use the macro. In the turbo symbol, we could do it without obviously this symbol. And then we load LDA with at one, which should be a, as for a, the ASCII opcode, the ASCII, and we put it in location 255. And then we go to load it. And I expect that by using this instruction, the value will then be placed. Also in what is the X register, Obviously in TAS, as you can see, the command line is minus C minus a minus B minus I second. The manual therefore is not particularly complex. Here, I've already launched it. We can launch it again. And here we can launch it directly regarding our vice. And as you can see, what is the value one? It actually displays it on the screen. And here we have 781 and so on. As you can see, it is correct use this type of opcode, particularly LAX, when we essentially want to load the same value into both registers without reloading the same value. A second time, both in register A and in register X, could also be used as protection for the code itself. Likely, why not? It could also be used in the creation of some demos. 
especially regarding the raster line precisely to optimize the code itself. Obviously, we are not going to see all of them here. We are essentially content with showing what is dollar to X, but uh, practically with a bit of familiarity. You can see that the other opcodes also essentially use the same behavior. And also here in what you can then do, it loads an 8-bit value in page 0, also using the Y register, thus adding, while the other two instructions, as you can see, A3, go directly to load what is a byte pointer. And here we can see it also from here. So uh, indexed, indirect, indirect, uh, indexed well. Let's say we move on to another, then to a second type of instruction that we saw last time, the store SAX well. Now let's look at the second type of opcode that effectively performs a store of the value contained in the A and X registers. Specifically, it performs the store of what is the A register into the location where it is specified. Obviously, here we need to refer if always in this case to absolute values, so differently from the others in our macros. Here, where it should be placed, we take what is our small example program. So in this case, it loads the A and X registers with the value contained in location 255 and essentially stores. So it performs the store of what is a value into the location, 124. But be careful here, there is a peculiarity. First of all, let's immediately take a look at it. What happens here? Well, clearly I've already compiled it. Anyway, I'll run it. Sorry, I'll run it here at this point on the screen correctly. We have an A, but this is not the behavior in which this opcode differs from the others because if we actually look at how it is, let's say, uh, designed, so to speak, or anyway, the PLA lines it activates. First of all, let's see that it doesn't influence any type of flag. And this is simply because the values of the status register are placed in the stack. And then, in fact, they are retrieved. But moreover, the value A is not influenced either. So the value is actually modified. But what happens internally? An AND operation, OK, is performed uh, with the value X in reference to the location. So an AND is performed between A and uh, X. It is stored in the location. And then in practice, the original value is retrieved. And we can see it here with another example. Well, let's go back from the bottom, from the end. And as you can see now, it no longer displays A, but it shows uh, another character. Because indeed, from the compilation and going backwards, we added uh, this instruction where X is loaded with a different value. And indeed, if we then go to verify what is stored in the location, 1024 is done. But taking into account an end, as it tells us here regarding the register, let's come here, however, to a more concrete example. So let's say that the ideal use, as this phrase tells us, is to set what is a permanent mask and store the values combined with this mask. So obviously, this phrase okay, it tells us everything and nothing. But we must think about the machines of that era, and particularly both the machines that were used with the NES, with sprites, with pointers that were managed in a particular way. And it then tells us later, in fact, in many graphic systems, especially the older ones like the NES and thus the Nintendo Entertainment System, the sprites in particular, they are graphic objects managed through a table of pointers, but also in the Commodore, of course. And these pointers are found in a table called the sprite table in memory. Essentially, they're, uh, they're addresses that uh, specify where the sprite graphics are located. This happens in the NES, but also in the Commodore. I tell it the location, and then it retrieves the table to display the sprite on the screen. So essentially, the strength, so to speak, of this code lies in more efficiently masking this type of operation essentially from this table one could infer the mask because here we are talking about a mask set up a mask is used to select or modify the bits in the loaded data then referring to the locations where the graphic part actually is in the specific case let's say the mask is if i understood correctly used to force some bits and leave others unchanged, then this is done to prepare the data, specifically in the indicated table. And then these data are used as pointers, or, so to speak, to the various sprite tables. Clearly, this is an explanation a bit more complex than expected. But essentially, this, from what I could understand, is practical uh, examples. Indeed, this is a use. 
At the moment, it is quite complex and convoluted, but indeed it has its own reason, because it prepares all the various tables for the possible pointers. And let's say, um, so to speak, it sets them up quite quickly and with few cycles, as we can see here. And with this, I'll stop here I mean, because it's already complex. We've also put a lot on our plate here, even in reference to this additional article, and we need time to digest uh, it all. We will return to tackle other opcodes in a more complex manner with further not explanations, but complications. And what can I say if you've made it with me up to this point? And in particular, all the way to the end of this video, I thank you and look forward to seeing you here on the channel for an upcoming a video, again on undocumented codes and other videos related to the channel. Thank you all, Claudio.